So today is part B, or it's uh, chapter 02B, power plant and system. So we're going to talk about the engine and stuff bolted to the engine for the next two or three hours worth of lecture. So when somebody says power plant, they're almost always talking about the engine. There is commonly more, sometimes more than one power plant. If you're on a jet airplane, sometimes there is a small engine. You don't have to write this down, but it's called an APU, an auxiliary power unit. And it's very common, even in medium to large business jets, to have this APU or this little jet engine back in the tail, and you fire it up as the pilot, and it'll provide electrical power, and it'll provide compressed air. And with these two things, you can usually run the uh, air conditioning on the ground. So that way, if it's hot and the passengers are going to show up in 15 minutes, you can fire up that APU, that power plant. Um, and on a lot of jet engine, jet big jets, you have to fire up the APU, and that power plant provides the power to start the biggest engines, but we're not going to go any deeper than that. What we are going to talk about is the fact that engines on little tiny airplanes, because we're talking about a little, uh, we're talking about earning a private pilot certificate. Most of the engines on airplanes are reciprocating engines or piston engines, and we're going to go into what does it mean to have pistons and what does it mean about reciprocating. Reciprocating means going back and forth and back and forth. Uh, there are gasoline reciprocating engines, and there are diesel reciprocating engines. If you wanted to, you could write in the gasoline engines are 99.9. of. If you looked at all the piston-powered airplane engines in the world, or the United States, whichever way you want to look at it, way less than one in a 1,000 runs on diesel. There's a few diesel engines out there, but it's ridiculously small. It's literally 99.9% of the airplane engines out there run on gasoline. There's a couple other engines that we're not, excuse me, we're not going to talk about very much. There's a lot of turbine engines. Turbine means that it's a jet engine, and you don't have to write this down, but you can use turbines to drive propellers. You can use them to drive big old fans. And you can also, there is one airplane out there right now you can buy that has an electric motor. Reedley College is going to get to use them sometime late this semester or next semester. But we're not really going to talk about turbine engines or electric engines, so I'm not going to ask you about them on the test. If you have questions outside of class, I'd be happy to talk about jet engines. I used to teach a full three-credit class to college students on jet engines. Of course, it was at an aviation university, and all the students there wanted to grow up and be jet pilots. And by the way, Jet Pilot is the name of a movie. It was made in 1957. It stars John Wayne, Janet Lee, and it was produced by Howard Hughes. So if you want to watch a Cold War era movie about jets, it's kind of it's a little on the cheesy side, but for 1957 it's pretty good. But it's called Jet Pilot. If you send me an email, I will bring a copy of that to the office and I will loan you a copy of that. But make sure you tell me if you want it VHS or DVD. Uh, it's you know. I, I, ch I watched the movie once. Within any given five-minute period, however you chop that movie up, within any f given five minutes, there is a, an airplane flying. If you chop it up here or here or here or here, within a, it's, it's, they never go five minutes without flying an airplane, if you like that sort of thing. All right, so let's talk about a typical reciprocating engine in a small airplane. So if you went out to an airport and said, aha, that is a small airplane, and we'll say a small airplane is, uh, you know, it, it, is under 12,500 pounds. The vast majority of them, they have reciprocating engines and they bear it on gasoline. Like I said, diesels are less than 0.01%, less than the one out of 1,000. They burn gasoline, that is, they, uh, they don't burn diesel, the typical airplane, little airplane engine. They're air cooled, that is, they don't have a radiator, they do not have coolant, they don't have radiator fluid. So most piston-powered airplane engines, in fact, the vast majority, again, it's 99.9% .9 again, are not water-cooled, so they don't have a radiator. They don't have uh, coolant. They're horizontally opposed. Yeah, question, Brian. The most expensive type of what? Gas? Aviation gasoline. At the airport, it's about $5 a gallon. So right now it's running around $2 a gallon more than uh, the cheap 87 octane. I think I bought 87 octane at Costco over the weekend. It was 259, but most places, if it's not Costco, it's like 269, 279. And at Reedley Airport, last I looked, it was four dollars and eighty cents a gallon. So just figure whatever whatever cheap gas is, add two bucks. 
And that's not bad. When I was in Arizona, there was one time gasoline was two fifty and aviation gasoline six dollars. Uh, and jet fuel is about the same. Jet fuel depends on where you are. It's ten or twenty or thirty cents more expensive or less expensive. So this is a reciprocating engine. This is a 100 horsepower engine. And if I could turn it, I would, but it doesn't let me. We're going to see a video, but this has four cylinders. It has four pistons on it. There's two on this side and two on the opposite side, and they oppose each other. So this engine is called a horizontally opposed engine because the pistons are sticking out horizontally, and there's one on one side and one on the other, one on the other. So they're opposing each other. Nine, again, 99% of the piston, it, well, this is why I'm saying typical, is they're pretty much all, almost all of them are like this. They're horizontally opposed. They're also direct drive. Direct drive means there is no transmission. You could also say it means the propeller spins the exact same RPM as the engine. It's, yeah, it's like having one gear. That's exactly what it is, exactly so what that means is if the propeller is spinning, I'm going to try hard to stay out of the plane of rotation to this propeller. It's not going to fire up. But if I spin this propeller around one revolution, then the inside of the engine spins from If you look in here close, and I'll you to look at this at break time, there's no gears in the pit, The shaft, the crankshaft of the engine is out, and the propeller is bolted on. It's called direct drive. It means there's no transmission. It means the propeller and the engine both spin around at the same RPM. Most little airplane engines have carburetors. If you look at most cars right now, most cars, in fact, I don't think anybody's even making a car that has a carburetor. What's the newest car that you could buy, it's used, that has a carburetor on it? It's probably 10 or 15 years old. I had a 97 Honda Civic. 97, that's 20 years ago. It had fuel injection on it. It didn't have a carburetor. So when was the last time? Now, now, now if you build your own engine and you want to put a carburetor on it, that's different. But I'm going to guess the last car that was built out of a factory, it's been at least 10, probably 15. In fact, could even be more than 20 years old. So there's some definite disadvantages to carburetors. The advantage that we're going to see on little airplanes is that carburetors are more simple and they cost less money than fuel injection systems. On cars, just for fun, does anybody know why fuel injection systems are better on cars than carburetors? There's like five different reasons. Yes, that's the primary. There's the fuel economy, which is driven by the federal government, and the other thing, which is driven by the, the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, is emissions. Yeah, fuel injection systems burn less fuel, and they produce less emissions. But we're talking about airplanes. And who cares how much pollution they make, right? Right. Okay, good. All right. Normally aspirated means it does not have a turbocharger, and it does not have a supercharger. And you're going, what is a turbocharger, and what is a supercharger? Effectively, it means there is no pump that pushes air into the engine. That's what turbochargers and superchargers do. If you want to talk to me after class, well, I could have a talk for a long, long time about turbochargers and superchargers. And, yes, there are cars with turbochargers. There are cars with superchargers. And those are pumps that push air into the engine. So if you pour air into the engine, you also more gasoline. So if there's more air and more gasoline in the engine, how much horsepower can this engine produce compared to last time? Your thumbs up. Yeah, you mean up. Yeah, that means the engine can produce more horsepower. Of course, you also have higher temperatures and higher pressures, so you're, you're, you're stressing the engine out more than you would otherwise. So you either, A, decide I'm going to overhaul it early, B, it's going to break early, or C, I'm going to put extra metal when I build it so it can handle it. Of course, if you put extra metal on it now, it weighs more. So the, the thing about turbochargers and superchargers on little airplanes is that it increases the weight and it increases the complexity. And so we're trying to we're talking very very small engines. LX, please don't use your cell phone during class. So normally aspirated means there's nothing pumping air into the engine, and we're going to talk about it here shortly. But effectively, that means the only way air gets into this engine is if the engine itself sucks the air in. As I, I know I did the chocolate milk analogy on an earlier day, but I'll use that again. How many people drank chocolate milk with a straw? Stand up. I know this is tough. 
I'm just kidding. You can stay seated. How many people? Raise your hand. Have you ever drank chocolate milk with a straw? Who's ever drank any fluid with a straw? Hydraulic fluid, gasoline, diesel fuel. Who has not used a straw? Okay. What you're actually doing inside of your mouth is you're creating a low pressure so that the fluid goes up the straw because the pressure on the outside of the straw inside that glass is a high pressure compared to what's inside of your mouth. So you're actually in reducing the pressure inside of your mouth and it's pulling the fluid into your mouth. Well, that's exactly what a piston engine does is it reduces the air pressure inside the engine and it pulls or sucks the air and the fuel into the engine. We're going to talk about that more today or tomorrow. All right, I'm going to ask you this question on the test, on the final exam. I'm going to say, name all five items in the four-stroke, five-cycle event of a gasoline-powered engine. So this is talking about a gasoline-powered engine. It also sort of works for diesels, but I don't want to confuse people. It's mostly the same for diesels. For diesels, though, there's usually not a spark plug. So I'm going to let you write these four, these five things down, and then we're going to discuss them. There's intake, compression, ignition, power, and exhaust. Now, while you're writing, you can almost listen, is that a lot of people, they call it the four-stroke power system, or they call it the auto cycle, O-T-T-O. You don't have to write down auto. But I like remembering that there's five things going on, so that's the way I'm going to ask you, because in reality, there's not just four strokes. There's four strokes plus one more thing. So the test question will read, name the five events in a four-stroke, five-event cycle on a gasoline-powered engine. And, of course, you go, oh, yeah, gasoline-powered engine, that's what's in little airplanes. So the intake stroke, I'm going to draw pictures. I tried setting up a gizmo where I could draw pictures on my, uh, you know what, maybe I can do it here. All right, we'll see what I can do. No, that's really whack, okay. All right, never mind, that's not going to work. So I'm going to have to draw pictures on the board. So the good news is I'm going to show you where a video is. So if you're not here to take notes today and you're watching the video later, you'll still be able to uh, see what's going on here. If we take just one of these cylinders, right, four, and, we, and we turn it right side up so it's pointed straight up, when I say it's a cylinder, it's round and it's long. So inside of there is a piston. So there's a piston, and we can talk for all day long about what is associated with the inside parts of an engine. But the very first stroke is called the intake stroke. And that's where the piston, in this case, is moving down. It's moving away from the top of the cylinder. And in that case, these valves, and it's letting in fresh air with gasoline. Air and fuel is coming in. So this piston is going to go up and down a total of four times. It's going to go down, up, down, up. So that's four things. And right about in the middle, the spark plugs are going to fire. So we've got to get air and fuel into the intake system or into the cylinder. And while the engine is spinning, this valve is open, and i got a nice video. Somebody else already made it that kind of shows this. Okay, then the next one is compression. Compression stroke, both of these valves are closed. Air and fuel cannot get in, and air and fuel cannot get out. It's not perfectly sealed, but it's pretty close. So this piston is moving upward, and the air pressure inside is getting higher and higher and higher. It's like a bicycle pump. A bicycle pump has a piston. You're just pushing it down. If you're using a manually powered one, you're pushing it down, and the air against the piston is getting higher and higher pressure. Just as an aside, what tends to happen to the temperature of that bicycle pump as you operate it? It gets warmer, yeah, because when you add energy, 
some of that energy is in the form of heat. In any case, in this case, we're not going to worry about too much about the fact that the air is getting hotter. But we're going to run that piston, and we're going to run that piston really, 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 really close to the top. If you measured how far this piston could go down on the intake stroke, and you measured the volume here, and you measured the volume of, how, of what was left, the ratio of these two would be called the compression ratio. So just say for fun, this was six cubic inches, and this volume in here was one cubic inch. You would say that this engine has a six to one compression ratio. That is, we're compressing six units of volume down to the size of one, or it's one-sixth as big. That's a very low compression engine, which does mean we can run low octane, like 87 octane. Like if that piston goes higher and there's only a half an inch left, that'd have a ratio of 12 to 1. We would need very high octane to prevent the fuel from catching on fire because it gets hot when you compress it. But I'm digressing. So in the compression stroke, the piston is moving towards the, out, the top of the cylinder or the outside of the cylinder, and the air gets to a higher and higher compression or a higher and higher pressure. Right near the top, and we're going to talk about it in depth. I'm just going to write ignition in here. Because just before the piston gets as high as it's going to get, just before, that's when the spark plug fires. So one could argue that the spark plug fires just near the very end of the stroke. And then I thought about it and said, okay, ignition is going to fire after the air is all going to be really, really happy. So the piston gets pretty much all the way as high as it'll go, and the spark plug fires. Now, we're going to watch a video that somebody made, and it's a really good video, but it says it talks about this as being a controlled explosion. And I do not like using the word explosion because it is not an explosion. It's not even a controlled explosion. It's a very rapid and smooth burn. It's a very rapid and smooth burn. If anybody says that it explodes, I don't really quite understand. Now, diesel engines are a different story, but diesel engine is more of a controlled explosion. We're not going to talk about diesels. All right, so the ignition, we'll say that the ignition occurs at the end of the compression stroke. The next stroke is the power stroke. In the power stroke, the piston is being pushed down because we have high pressure. This high pressure comes from the fact that energy is being released from the gasoline. Gasoline is made out of hydrogen and carbon and nitrogen and a few other things. It's called hydrocarbons. It's, uh, it's distilled from petroleum that's pumped out of the ground. Have you ever seen a, a TV show called the, Hever the Beverly Hillbillies? Is anybody? I know that's old school, but the oil comes out of the ground. All right. You take oil, you take it to a refinery, they heat it up, you get fumes off of it. You make gasoline, you stick it in pump pipes, you ship it across the states, then you put it in big diesel trucks, then you haul it to gas stations and to airports. All right, so this gasoline has chemical energy in it. When we catch this fuel on fire, it's going to generate a lot of heat. It's going to give off that chemical energy is going to turn into heat energy. This heat energy is going to make those molecules of air and the fuel bounce around a whole lot faster than normal. So let's just say for fun, we had a little room that was, uh, was five by five, five feet by five feet, and we put like seven people in it. Now, if they're bouncing around and hitting each other, it doesn't up against the wall too hard until they start bouncing around even more. If they bounce around and hit each other more, what's going to happen to the sides of the walls of this room? If the people start, right, let's make it ten by ten. So now they can get up a run. If they're moving faster when they hit the wall, are they going to stress the wall more, or are they going to stress it less than if they just walk into it? It's going to stress it more if they're running. So I want you to think about this little area inside of the cylinder when the spark plug fires. The gasoline or the ga energy store, the chemical energy in the gasoline, turns into heat energy. And now those molecules in there, they bounce around a whole lot faster than they did before. So when they hit the top of the cylinder, it's going to stress the cylinder and when they more. When it hits the top of the piston, it's going to harder. It's going to push on that piston. 
if we had a pressure gauge on the side of the It's literally as if someone is on the inside pushing this piston down. And that's where the power comes from, because there's a, I'll show you here shortly, but the piston is connected to the crankshaft and the engine. So if we can push that piston down, then that means we can make the crankshaft spin, and if the crankshaft is bolted to the propeller, we can get the propeller to spin. So what we're literally doing with this engine, it is literally an energy conversion machine. We're taking chemical energy into gasoline, we're turning it into heat energy. The heat energy is being turned into rotational energy, that is, we're making the engine spin. And that rotating energy is being converted by the propeller into thrust. So we have multiple energy conversions all going on at the same time. Or maybe I ought to say continuously. So the power stroke comes right after the ignition, or the spark plug fires, and the pressure goes up really high inside of the cylinder and pushes down on the piston. Now when that piston, and I'm going to draw it in here, during the power stroke, the valves are still shut. The last stroke is the exhaust stroke. And in that case, the exhaust valve is open, and the piston is moving up, and it's pushing the exhaust uh, gases out of the engine because we need to get rid of all this burnt gasoline and all this burnt air so we can turn around and start all over again. Just as an aside, I'm not going to ask you this on the text, but if you have a perfect reciprocating engine, a perfect reciprocating engine, all of the oxygen inside of the engine would get burned and all of the gasoline would get burned every single time. Is to try to burn off of the gasoline. You'd have the least amount of emissions and you'd burn, get the best fuel economy. But perfect is not what humans are good at. So we're not going to have a perfect piston engine. Does anybody have any questions about these four strokes, five events? Johnny? Oh, it's probably past 99%. Yeah, if you take a car engine that's got computer-controlled ignition, computer-controlled fuel injection, and you run it at one RPM, and you don't vary the it just sits there at 3,000 RPM, you can, I'm sure you could get it up past 99% fuel efficiency and, and air-burning efficiency. I'm, I'm, I don't know enough about it to say, and, and it's probably you could get it to pollute the least, but not pollute zero. One of the problems with burning gasoline or diesel, since gasoline and diesel are both have made out of hydrogen and carbon and nitrogen, one of the things that happens when you burn gasoline or diesel, oxygen in the air, it connects to the hydrogen in the fuel, and you blow out water, which is not a problem, but some of the carbon connects with the oxygen, and you get carbon monoxide, and you get carbon dioxide. Now, you're used to breathing out carbon dioxide. I mean, you don't think about it. It's like, oh, yeah, there's that carbon dioxide. But plants convert carbon dioxide into carbon, so they take out the carbon and blow off oxygen. They exhale oxygen. The problem with the carbon monoxide in airplanes is that if that gets into the cabin, it replaces the oxygen on your blood vessels. And so you can breathe, but the oxygen doesn't stick in your blood, and then you pass out and you die. I hate carbon monoxide poisoning. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas and keeps heat energy inside of the Earth's atmosphere. But we'll talk about greenhouse gases outside of class. All right, so there's this really cool video that Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University made. And we're going to watch it from, uh, for about two minutes here. Three minutes. System. Most modern airplanes are equipped with fuel injection systems, so we'll spend a little more time on and training aircraft are equipped with reciprocating engines. Reciprocating engines have several cylinders. Inside of those cylinders, fuel and air are mixed, compressed, and then ignited. 
As this fuel-air mixture is ignited, its explosive force moves the piston inward. These pistons are connected to a crankshaft, and when the pistons move in and out, that causes the crankshaft to rotate. The propeller is connected to the crankshaft, so as the crankshaft rotates, so does the propeller. The cylinders undergo a continuous four-stroke cycle. The four strokes are called intake, compression, power, and exhaust. The first stroke, the intake stroke, is when the piston inside the cylinder moves away from the cylinder head. As the piston moves away, the intake valve opens and the fuel-air mixture is sucked into the cylinder's combustion chamber. Once the piston has reached the base of the cylinder, it's time for the second stroke, compression. During this phase, the intake valve is closed and the piston reverses direction, moving back towards the cylinder head. This compresses the fuel-air mixture since it has nowhere to escape. Once the piston approaches the top of the cylinder, we begin the third stroke, power. Two spark plugs at the head of the cylinder each let off a spark, which ignites the fuel mixture and makes it combust. This controlled explosion pushes the piston back inward towards the base of the cylinder, which in turn rotates the crankshaft, and therefore the propeller. Finally, we reach the last stroke, exhaust. During this phase, the exhaust valve opens and the piston moves back towards the cylinder head, pushing out the combusted gases, commonly called exhaust. Then, the process starts all over again, repeating the process thousands of times every minute. On a typical four-cylinder engine, each one of the cylinders is in the middle of a different stroke. So effectively, what's happening in a four-cylinder engine, only one of these four cylinders is generating horsepower at any given moment. The other three are still either doing intake or compression or exhaust. So that's one nice, that's if you notice, if you look at small cars and you look at small airplanes, most of them have at least four cylinders. Now, how about a gasoline-powered lawnmower? It has one cylinder. It still is a four-stroke, five-event system, but the, the engine runs more rough, and it doesn't like to run at really, really low RPMs because three-fourths of the time it's not generating power. So the more cylinders you put on it, the smoother it gets. That way, one cylinder is always in the power stroke, and the engine is able to keep the crankshaft rotating, thereby allowing the remaining cylinders to go through their respective stroke. As we just saw in these four strokes, there are two valves at the head of each cylinder that open and close to allow the fuel mixture in and the exhaust gases out. But what controls those valves? That would be a camshaft. The camshaft is a rotating cylinder situated above the crankshaft with various oblong lobes protruding from it. These lobes push on rods that connect to each valve, pushing them open. The valves are spring-loaded and will return to the closed position as the camshaft lobes move away from their respective rod. Getting the valves to open at the exact moment is very crucial for the engine to operate. Because of that, the camshaft is geared to the crankshaft so they will remain synchronized. The camshaft is geared to spin half as fast as the crankshaft. This results in the valves opening twice during the four-stroke cycle. Now, how do we get the fuel and air into the cylinders? It's simple. The induction system. Inside of the cockpit of most general aviation aircraft, there are the... Yeah, we'll play induction system here. Probably get there tomorrow. Oh, wait. I guess we'll get to induction system now. So the induction system is what gets air from the outside of the engine into the engine. So we have the, that's ex the opposite of the exhaust system. The exhaust system gets the engine out, the, uh, the burnt up air and fuel out of the engine and gets it away from the airplane. So the induction system is what, is what are the parts that help us get air from outside the airplane and get them into the engine. So we're always going to have an air filter. And the reason we have an air filter is so that it can't suck up things that ruin the inside of the engine. And if we had a carburetor or fuel injection system, those dirt and rocks could actually clog it up and make it stop working. So it might not just wear it out sooner, it might actually stop it from working. There's also going to be tubes or ducts from the air cleaner to the carburetor 
and then from the carburetor to the engine. And we're going to mostly talk about airplane engines with carburetors since most little airplane engines have carburetors. It's not 99.9% .9%, but it's probably well over 90% of the little airplanes that are flying right now have carburetors and not fuel injection. Can you still buy uh, now there's a, there's a lot of airplanes out there with fuel injection and there's a lot of airplanes being built you can buy with fuel injection. But you can actually still buy airplanes with carburetors because carburetors are less expensive. All right, and I'm going to include the intake port, and that's that last little bit of duct that's on the engine before the intake valve. If you remember the diagrams uh, about uh, cylinders during the four cycle five event uh, reciprocating gasoline engine system, the valves have to open and that intake valve has to open. So I like to include that part of the induction system. All right. Let's see, we've got 12 more minutes. I think we're going to get to this and maybe, maybe I have to watch another five minutes of that video. If you have a small piston powered airplane, which is likely to be the one you're going to fly and likely to be for flying and likely to be the one you're going to rent, you need to understand that it controls how much air and how much gasoline or how much air and fuel go into the engine, but it also controls the ratio or how much of it that comes in, how much of it is air versus how much it is the gasoline, because that's really important. Let's see how many people have opened up a 55-gallon drum of gasoline taken the lid off so it's about two and a half feet diameter of gasoline and then toss the match on top of it. I can see by your lack of raising your hands that I'm the only person that. I'm just kidding. It would be kind of fun if I was standing far enough away. If it was cold enough and gasoline vapors weren't rising up off of the, ga off of the gasoline, you could actually take that match and stick it down into the gas. Sorry, I know you're all busy writing things down. You know, that's a good question. Uh, it would have to be below the flash point of the gasoline. The flash point is that temperature. It has to be warm enough so the gasoline evaporates enough to catch on fire. What people tend to understand, because we haven't had to notice it, we don't notice it with our bare eyes. But if you want something to burn, you need to get into a vaporous state. It needs to turn into a gas, not a liquid, not a solid, but a gas. In this case, when I say the word gas, I'm talking about something that is, is like air. It's not a liquid. I'll let you guys finish writing down before I talk some more, because I know how much fun you do. You all have writing things down. I, want, I don't want to get in the way of your fun of taking notes. They fixed the air conditioners over the weekend, and they said they got them turned on at the beginning of the day, but it would take all day for the, the classrooms to cool down. Seems like the last two months, the air conditioning system on the campus breaks about every two weeks. They actually have a chiller system. They cool the air down on the other side of the campus and then pump it through insulated cold, air, cold water through insulated pipes, and then they run uh, air past like a radiator in each building. To cool the air down. It's called a chiller. So there's some big building somewhere on campus that they cool the water down. You'll notice in the spelling of carburetor that it uses one, two, three, four out of five, A E I O U. It just doesn't use the I. Carburetor, all the vowels are different. It doesn't use A twice, it doesn't use U twice, it doesn't use E twice, and it doesn't use O twice. It took me till I was in my 40s to realize the carburetor that you spelled it with four different vowels. All right, so carburetors control how much air and gas go into the engine, but it controls how much air and how much fuel. But before I get to that point, I can make sure you understand gasoline does not burn while it's still a liquid. Gasoline is a liquid. Gasoline has to evaporate into a gas. It has to evaporate into a vapor. 
So we need the air. The air is already in a vaporous state. Right? Most of the liquid oxygen somewhere that's really cold, we're used to only seeing oxygen when it's already a gas. We're used to seeing gasoline as a liquid. When you spill it, putting gas in your car, when it turns into a vapor, when it turns into a gas, you don't see the part that evaporates. Okay, so as a human, it's hard for us to think about gasoline as being in a vaporous state. Remember, effectively, as far as humans are concerned, things are either in a solid state, a liquid state, or a gaseous state, or vaporous state. So you've got to understand that this gasoline has to turn into a gas. So that's one of the things the carburetor does. It allows, the, it allows a place for the gasoline to evaporate and for the ga effectively for the gasoline to turn into a gas. Okay, so when you look at this word here, this is a fun word, so you can plan on the final exam when you turn it in. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to point to this word on the test. It will be like the very last one. It will say, pronounce this word. So no one will want to be the first one to turn it in because they won't remember how to say stoichiometric. I'm just kidding. I will, not, I will not ask you to pronounce stoichiometric. I just like saying stoichiometric. I think it's Latin or Greek. Does anybody take Latin or Greek in school? Yeah, I don't know. In any case, a stoichiometric ratio is a ratio, of, as far as gasoline and air is concerned, that when it burns, all of the air gets burned up and all, it's really all of the oxygen gets burned up, and all of the gasoline in its vaporous state gets burned up. There's no leftover oxygen or air. There's no leftover gasoline. And this ratio for gasoline is 14.7 pounds of air for every one pound of gasoline. But here's, again, the problem. We're used to looking at things, and we don't know how much they weigh, so we kind of compare things volume to volume. How much, how big is a pound of gasoline? How big is a pound of air? It'd be easy if I said, how big is a cubic foot of gasoline? I'd say, well, it's 12. How big is a cubic foot of air? Oh, well, it's 12 inches by 12 inches by 12 inches. About volume versus volume, I'm talking about weight. So 14.7 pounds of air, how big is that? This 14.7 is really interesting. I think the universe ha has coincidences that are not really coincidences, or maybe it's just we as humans. If you took a square inch, you measured a piece of paper, and it was an inch long by an inch wide, and you set it down on the ground, and you could measure the weight of that column of air, one inch by one inch, and you went all the way into space, but it was just one inch by one inch. That weighs 14.73 pounds. That's a lot of air. That's a lot of air. And that's the 14.7. Okay. A pound of gasoline. How much does a gap on a gas weigh? You're going, to, I'm going to, you're going to have to know this as a pilot. How much does gasoline weigh? The difference between car gas and aviation gasoline doesn't make enough difference to make a difference there. How many pounds does a gallon of gas weigh? Well, it, let me ask you this. If you had a big giant bowl and you poured in a gallon of water and a gallon of gasoline, which would go to the top and which would go to the bottom? Because I'm going to tell you, gasoline and water don't mix very well. They tend to separate out like oil and vinegar. You think water does what? Goes down. You think water does what? Goes down. Yeah, you're both correct. Water is more dense than gasoline. The gasoline actually rises. That's why on a, good, a day that's rained, like if it went and rained right now, think of all the oil that has dropped on it. Oil is lighter than gasoline, too. Think of all the oil on the street right now, and it rained really, really good, the water gets down there, the oil is lighter than the water, so the oil actually goes to the top of the water, which is why after it's rained, you look around the parking lot, and you see all that shiny stuff with rainbow colors, that's light bouncing off, reflecting, refracting off of engine oil that's been now lifted up because the water is heavier 
per cubic foot, or you could say the water is more dense. Okay, a gallon of water is 8.34 pounds per gallon. Gasoline is less. Gasoline is 6 pounds a gallon. So you ought to write that down. Aviation gasoline or any other kind of gasoline weighs 6 pounds per gallon. So if we talked about it, I'm not going to go any farther on this. I'm belaboring it. But 14.7 pounds of air is a boatload of air, and one pound of gasoline is only a sixth of a gallon. But remember, in the carburetor, the ga what's going to happen to the gasoline before it gets burned? It's going to have to evaporate. It has to go from a liquid into a gaseous state, or it's got to turn into a vapor. All right. So now I want to talk about lean ratio versus rich ratio. If the carburetor is set up and it's burning things at a stoichiometric ratio, all the air gets burned, all the gasoline gets burned. But there's going to be times when we want to have excess fuel. So if too much fuel or not enough air, same thing, the ratio won't be 14 points. It might be 1. 12 amounts of air. So that means there's two gasoline going in to get burned. That means all the gas won't get burned. So I'm going to say that again. If it is a rich mixture, then all the gasoline does not burn. So it may go in there as a vapor, and some of that gas isn't going to get burned, and it's going to go out the exhaust without getting burned. Question? Lean is the other way around. A lean ratio means that all of the air does burn. That means some of that oxygen goes into the cylinder. Most of it's going to get burned, but some of it is going to go out the exhaust pipe and the oxygen isn't going to get burned. That is lean. That is a lean mixture. Now, on airplanes, there's the throttle. It's usually painted black, and there's a mixture. It's usually red. It's almost always red. And you as the pilot get to vary that ratio. You're varying the mixture. When I say mixture, I'm talking about the ratio of gasoline to air. Now, if you don't touch it, the carburetor is going to try to set that ratio. The problem is the carburetor is set up to work really, really, really good at sea level. That little red lever at sea level push that mixture control all the way forward. The carburetor is going to be really close to a stop. Ratio. It's going to be a little on the rich side because you want to cool the engine. You see, if you don't burn that gasoline, that gasoline will get hotter, and it'll take heat energy out of the engine and take that heat energy out of the exhaust. So if you want the engine to run cooler, and this part you need to write it down, if you want the engine to run cooler, you want to run a little bit rich. And there's several times when you want it to run rich. The most important time you want it to run a little bit rich is when you are at takeoff power. So that's the most likely time you're going to want the engine to be rich is when you have pushed the throttle all the way forward, and that's called takeoff power. So what are you going to do with that red knob? You're going to have pushed it all the way forward. The problem is when you go to altitude, the carburetor is measuring how much air goes in the, through the carburetor by volume. But when you go up in altitude, the air doesn't stay the same. The air gets thinner. Well, I think at this moment, and we're going to pick up again in the middle of the And I'll meet you back in here. It's 10 after in real life, so I'll see you back at 20 after on your, in real life.